Praise God. Listen to this. It was Dwight Eisenhower that made this ponderous statement. He said, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. Praise God. With me today is one of the pioneers. Actually, there are very few people you can count them and your fingers that God is using around the world as he's using Dr. John Edmond Haggai. Dr. Haggai has been teaching leadership since 1968. So he's a tailblazer, a barrier breaker, and he's a protagonist on this field. And please get a pen and a paper ready because he's loaded, God has raised him and kept him and equipped him to minister to us on the subject of leadership. So he's graced us to do this segment from his office, from his corporate office. So Dr. Haggai, welcome to Thank leadership. You. Thank you, and I'm glad you said I'm loaded, but I am sober. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes. good to be with you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to millions of Africans out there about leadership. Thank you. Praise God. And Dr. Hagar, one of the things we try to do in the African Pastors Network is to get people like yourself, the best in leadership in the world, to talk to, to strengthen the top leaders in Africa. So Africa can be developed and move away from the third world to the first world. Yeah. Praise God. Well, the truth of the matter is, that the Africans are providing the evangelical punch in Europe today, and almost all the, the flourishing churches are African leaders. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, the Europeans went to Africa 100 years ago, now the Africans are going to Europe. Yes, yes. Amazing, wonderful. I'm making tremendous. You know, I've only been to South Africa, but I'm hoping to make an extensive trip in Africa next year. Yes, yeah. yes, it'll be fruitful, it'll be powerful. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. And the hey guy, we're talking to someone like yourself with tremendous wisdom from God on leadership. I have some questions that I've written down for you. And the, the first question is, what, what, who are the people that influenced you? I know that we have this uh, quote in Africa that if a tree does not make a forest, you know, there's got to be some people that God placed around you that were your significant others. I would have to say, of course, my father, uh, who uh, was born in Damascus, Syria, and fled to this country a hundred years ago last September. He lived to be 92. He read the Bible through 103 times. He was a linguist, and he would... He would never tell you that, but I knew he kept records, so I finally found him just before he died, and he put down the date he began the reading, what language it was in, like maybe the Hebrew, the Old Testament, the Greek, the New Testament. He did his own translation of the Psalms from uh, the Hebrew. Uh, he, uh, he told me about uh, Naboth. Yes. You remember? Yes. And it said Naboth was wroth mm -hmm. after uh, <coughs> he was told about stealing, about the lamb being stolen. Yes. He said the word wrath really should be translated, he was hot in the end of his nose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but dad, I told him it was his godly life that kept me from being an atheist. Now, he was an old country father. Mm. Now, I don't know if you understand old country father, but if they want your opinion, they give it to you. Oh, praise God. <laughs> yeah. uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> From the standpoint of pulpit work, Dr. Robert G. Lee of Memphis, and a doctor by the name uh, 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 S. M. Lockridge of Southern California, a wonderful black leader. Um, probably nobody had a greater influence on my life, vis-a-vis -vis my interest globally, than John Mott, M-O-T-T. -T. John Mott uh, made a trip around the world four times before there were airplanes. So it took him two years every time. He wrote 46 books. 
He recruited 240,000 leaders on all continents. Here's a statement he meant, made. <clears throat> he who does the work is not so profitably employed as he who multiplies the doers. Hmm. And so instead of, as Moody said, doing the work of 100 men, and as you've already indicated, uh, get 100 people to do the work. Yes. Yeah. And uh, those are some of the men that had a big influence. There was a lady who had a big influence on my life, in addition to my dear mother. <clears throat> Her name was Helen Gardner. She was an educational director, built the largest Sunday school, a white Sunday school east of the Mississippi River. Wow. Never married. Brilliant, educated, attractive. I said to her one day, I was much younger, she was probably 20 years my senior, I said, Helen, you're so attractive and so brilliant and so spiritual, how have you never married? Well, as you say, I'm spiritual and I know the scripture. And so I just followed that great scripture, Paul the Apostle in 1 Thessalonians 4, yes. I would not have you ignorant brethren. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's powerful. Uh, but she taught me a lot about uh, leadership. For, here's another question for you. For someone that is being raised up into leadership, because one of the things is the one of the areas we're trying to get into is ministering to pastors, but we're not just limited to pastors. Uh, what are some of the core values that they need to establish in order to make sure that they finish well? Energy. Okay. Who you are. You've got to have energy. Secondly, you have to have your mission. Okay. You ought to have your mission statement written out and go over it at least every day. I try to go over it when I go over my, my devotions. Okay. Thirdly, attitude. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Ask the Lord to deliver you from blind ambition and from vain uh, activities. Okay. Attitude. Someone said, uh, your attitude will determine your altitude. Yes. Fourth, set goals. That's what you do, you set goals. But that's not enough. You have to make plans. A goal without a plan is a wish without a hope. Yes. There's no, not gonna do it. Yes. A lot of folks have goals, but they're only wishes. They don't make plans. Yes. And my suggestion is, you do it with your pen or pencil and paper. There is something releasing and an invigorating about using your senses. You have, you have the tactile sense, you feel the instrument. You have the auditory sense, you hear it moving on the paper. Yes. You have the visual sense, you see it. Yes. You take advantage, it's a multi-sensory impact. So it's much better than if you put it in the computer. Yes. Put it in the computer later, but when you're putting it down, I suggest you write it. Prioritize. There's no way you're gonna get everything done. Okay. So you've got to figure out, if I cannot do these three things, which two things are the most important? Yes. Or if I can't get these two things, which one thing is the most important? Uh, then synergize. You've already alluded to that. Yes. Uh, work with other people. Uh, people do not realize that John D. Rockefeller, who, by the way, was the wealthiest man in the history of the world, in today's money, he was worth three hundred and thirty four billion that's with a B billion dollars Wow but he gave half of it away he gave half of it away the reason he met a uh, Baptist minister Frederick T Gates uh, Rockefeller's health was very bad and uh, he said only two things I can do uh, with my wealth I can buy food and buy clothes my food does not digest and my clothes don't fit. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, he, uh, at 54, he was in very bad health, and Gates said, you're drowning in your wealth. And he got him to give. And the man gave one half of his fortune. Uh, Dr. Um, Vernon Broyles, who was minister here in Atlanta for many, many years, now with the Lord, said the only freedom from the tyranny of money is to ruthlessly give it away. 
Praise God. Isn't that good? <laughs> That's good. So synergize. Now, Rockefeller would not have accomplished what he did without Fred T. Gates. Yeah. Then organize. Okay. I, uh, there's a man in this city, I better not use his name. He made $800 million in four years. That was back in the 80s and 90s, so it's worth well over a billion dollars in today's currency. He was in insurance. He developed a whole new product. We were sitting in the airport, I'll never forget, in Tokyo, in the Pan American Lounge. And he's very modest, but I kept probing, and he said, I'm not smarter than other people. I'm not a better insurance salesman than other people. But where I surpass them all is organization. Now, let me give you an illustration. You can go to any library in the world and find what you want to find. If you know the Dewey Decimal System, they all use Dewey Decimal. Yeah. He said, try to go to somebody else's files, personal files, and find anything. So he came up with what they call information retrieval, where he can retrieve anything. Your filing isn't worth a hill of frostbitten beans if you can't retrieve it. Yes. <laughs> you know, a lot of times you spend too much time even looking for this stuff. Yes. Uh, so organization. He said, John, I'll never forget. He said, it's my organization that has made me, I'll never forget this, millions and millions and millions and millions. And he gave away millions. He gave, I know of over 100 million he's given away, but yeah. a lot more. Uh, then optimize, don't waste your time waiting. Optimize. Lord Nelson of the British Navy said his success was due to the fact he always arrived a quarter of an hour beforehand. Now, with our traffic we have today, that's not always possible. Uh, but uh, then it was um, of Frederick, I mean, uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Between appointments, maybe just 10 minutes, you always have a book, and you spend that 10 minutes reading and taking a note on what he read. That's optimizing. Yes. And finally, act now. I believe that procrastination is probably the most devastatingly damaging thing you can do. I remember my old theology professor said, man is as lazy as he dares to be. And the guy said, I'm not lazy. That's because you're not very daring. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Praise God. Yeah. But um, uh, here I am. In two months, I enter my 90th year. And uh, somebody, <laughs> somebody said, you haven't retired? I said, retirement's for people who don't like what they're doing. Yes, yes. Well, then they'll pontificate. Well, that's right. The Bible doesn't say anything about retirement. Then I give them this zinger. Nor does it say anything about a five-day work week. Yes. <laughs> Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Yes, yes. Right? Yes, seven, yes. yes, yes. Uh, but uh, I enjoy because why would you retire from play? And my work is my play. What can I be doing right now that would be more exciting than speaking to you, Dr. Ezra? I have a question for you. Yeah. Because, you know, many people in the world don't enjoy what they're doing. The Tohei guy, uh, how did you know? Because at first you were a pastor of a mega church. How did do you, you know, tell us the transition from pastoring to now? You know, you were a global leader then too, but to now being just kind of a, being an expert in dealing with war leaders, how did the Lord transition you? My folks were always interested in missions. Uh, they would mimeograph and mail out prayer letters for missionaries. Okay. That had an impact on me. Subliminal, but an impact. I'll tell you a story. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I was at the Southern Baptist Convention in 1955. I was 31 years old. And the worst attendance is at the Monday afternoon pastors conference. They're all catching up <coughs> at the restaurant and so forth. <coughs> so I was sitting in this cavernous convention hall, probably seat 5,000. There may have been 20 of us. 
And Dr. Ramsey Pollard said, I'm now going to name the nominating committee for next year's leaders. Sam Payton, nothing. Ed Brooks, nothing. Went down the line, number three, nothing, nothing. Number seven, John Evan Haggis said, here. And the few there gave me a very small hand. And politics being what they are, he had to make me chairman of the committee, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was the only one there. Yes. And politics being what they are, he said, I was thinking uh, that Dr. Sterling Price would be the ideal. I said, I think you're right. And politics being what they are, Dr. Sterling Price obviously had to invite me to speak at the next year, didn't he? So he sent me a letter and he said, I want you to talk about money. I said, Dr. Price, I have spent my lifetime studying money, but please really, you don't need to have me speak, and I just don't want people to think I only have one string on my harp. He said, forgive me, select your subject. So I selected the subject, the place of the pulpit in evangelism. Yes. And the next worst attendance is Monday night. And I had the first session, which was terrible, but they delayed, there were delays after delays after delays. I didn't speak until 8.20, ideal time. The press was there, they were antsy. It was the first time, I'm told, since Phillips Brooks, the Episcopalian from Copley Square in Boston in the 1800s, that a precy of a message was carried on the front page of every major daily in America. In less than two weeks, I had more invitations than I could have handled in 20 years. So I went into evangelism, itinerant evangelism. And then, after one of my tremendous, uh, the, the best, most God-blessed uh, campaign I had was in Baltimore at the Civic Center, I came home and I was having a, an adrenaline rush. I, I wanted to sleep, but I was still pumped up. You know what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, yes. And so I w did something. I was watching the French Foreign Legion in the, in the Arabian Desert. And uh, I was mumbling, I sure like to see the land of my fathers. Now what makes that so interesting? I'm in bed usually by 9 or 9.30. I don't even let my wife pray at night because she gives God a three-year course of systematic theology. <laughs> then she makes Paul stream. By that time, I'm long gone. So I pray at night, let her pray in the morning. She goes as long as she wants. And she said, why don't you go? I said, woman, speak with fork tongue, rooms for rent upstairs, shingles loose. What do you mean, why don't I go? I haven't got time to go. Well, she knew I'd been invited to speak at, uh, at uh, St. Andrews, and then to it's speak- Scotland, yeah. Scotland, and then to speak at uh, the Berlin Brigade, a military in Berlin, and she said, did you go over to Beirut? And in Beirut, in Beirut, some godly men came and said, Brother Hush, that's my Arabic name. Tell the missionaries to stop treating us as though we're inferior. It flew all over me. I wasn't very sweet. I said, let me tell you, everything I am and have, including my existence, I owe to the foreign missionary who was overworked, underpaid, and underprayed for. That was back before airplanes. It took them five weeks to get there. They never got to go back to a wedding or a funeral or a graduation. They did not do that. And on average, one out of every four died and was buried under the sky. No, 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 Habibi. Habibi is a term of endearment in the Arabic. You're reaching the classless people, but you're missing the people that make the government run. You're missing the government workers, the educators, the professional people, the Dr. Ezra's. You're missing these people who make things happen. And now on my way back, I realized that Paul the Apostle dealt only with leaders. How do I know? Only 3% of the people of the first century were literate who read his letters. And then he said, I want to go to Spain. Why Spain? It was the intellectual capital of the world. Quintilian had his school of oratory there. Yes, yes. And then you had uh, Seneca, who uh, later became, went to Rome, became the prime minister under Nero. And uh, so that was the genesis of Haggai Institute for leadership for evangelism. Wow. I have no, I'm not going to spend one minute of my efforts and leadership if it's not going to eventuate people being better at spreading the gospel. That's powerful. That's laser beam focus. That is. Yes, yes. And look at what God has caused you to achieve. And 
listen, Dr. Hagan has many books in, in, uh, in uh, the APN conference in Atlanta. One of the books that I, I purchased uh, from the Tohegai's uh, uh, staff is the 365 things every successful leader should know. And, and Dr. Tohegai on page five, uh, there's in one of the first laws is called Hegai laws. It says, attempt something so great for God, it is doomed to, f to failure unless God be in it. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And uh, you know, I know we have to kind of wrap up because of your time schedule, but many times some of the things you say that are so powerful is I believe that any dream that is not something God must do, it's not real. Yes. It's not real. Yeah. Because, and then you're giving us the Ten Commandments of Leadership and the first one being taking care of our health. Yeah. That's powerful. And I know Dr. Walker and some other people were telling me that you have a gym and you work out every day. I do. That's powerful. Yeah. That's great. And then the second is writing down the mission statement. He says, go over it every day. You know, I know Habakkuk, that's the Habakkuk principle. Write the vision. Yes, and go over it. I think it was the late Jerry Farwell that he did a teaching on that too, uh, going to setting up time where we go up every day and review the vision. Yeah. Praise God. Well, Dr. Hagar, is there anything else you want to tell leaders in Africa? The Lord has used you to raise many leaders in Africa. I'm hoping to meet you in Africa. Yes. And come and visit me when you're here. My schedule is so, I'm so embarrassed, but this time of the year, it reads like a Pan American timetable. Well, no, I better say something else, Singapore Airline timetable. But at any rate, uh, um, there's one other thing I thought you might be interested in. Yes. And that is, <clears throat> you know it, <clears throat> Faith acts only in the realm of the humanly impossible. If it's possible, it doesn't need faith. Yes. And most folks have wishes, but they don't have faith. Yeah. The thing I pray for the first, I have my nine-page prayer list every day, that God will give me faith, the ability to visualize the thing I pray as an already accomplished reality. Yeah. And the amazing thing, God seems to act only at the last minute. Hmm. You know, Moses put your rod over the sea. Well, you can't do that 50 yards back. You'll be right on the brink, right? And he said to Abraham, take thy son, thy only son. And he didn't intervene until Abraham had him on the altar with a sword ready to plunge to stay thy hand. Now that takes faith. Yes. Do you believe God or do you not believe God? Yes. And he said, I said, Lord, I don't know if I have faith as a grain of mustard seed, but please give it to me because I believe the faith is a gift of God. But so is air, but you've got to breathe. Yes. So is faith, but you've got to act on it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's powerful because it takes faith. And that one of the things I believe is you can't have faith in God unless you spend time with God because God is supernatural, yeah. and what he says is beyond the five senses. Yeah. It was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte that said, a leader is a dealer in hope. That's great. Yes, you know. That's good. Yes, you know Who that. Who said that? Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, yes. Yes. You know that in Africa, one of the things we want to see is a lot of the leaders in Africa are Hegai Institute graduates, okay? And one of the things is to encourage, say, maybe in a sentence, something to encourage African leaders. Some of them are facing, some of the African Christians are facing the influence of Muslims and destruction of their churches. And the African economy still not being developed. It's not that the Africa doesn't have the resources, but just a sentence of encouragement to African leaders. You know, we have our lead professor is the Pope's personal representative. Yeah. Evangelical belief. Uh, he uh, does the orientation with 150 bishops every September in Rome. He's got a great definition. A leader must know the way, 
go the way and show the way. Isn't that good? Yes. Simple. Most truths are simple. Yes. It's almost like the the philosophy of Ezra. The Bible said that Ezra first studied the word, lived it, and taught it. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you for coming. Dr. Thank you for your patience Dr. and your tolerance. Oh, no. And, uh, no it's, it's, we get to have plenty of time. Yes, yes. And, and, and listen out there. Um, maybe there's someone that is watching out there, and, and you're just maybe you're, at the, you're frustrated in life. You feel like, well, I'm not a top leader. I will never get there. Let me tell you one of the things I'm gleaning from what the, the John Edmund Hega is saying. Never write yourself off because there's still, as long as you're breathing, there's potential, there's possibility. What you need to do is what the Apostle Paul said, embrace the Ten Commandments of Leadership and you will succeed. So let's take this opportunity to pray for you right now. Maybe you're not born again and Ooh. you need to be saved. Amen. So that's the first achievement you can ever do in life. So, so uh, go ahead. If they will follow me on Twitter, yes. it's at John E. Haggai. Okay. John E. Haggai. And uh, they'll be able to get some things that may be encouraging to them. Absolutely. And also uh, on our website, I'll be glad to, Facebook, yes. Yes. I'll be glad to help anybody that I can, and that way I can multiply myself. Yes. Thank you for Thank you so much. the joy of being with you. Yes, and listen, just say this prayer with us. I confess with my mouth Amen. that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe it in my heart. Jesus, come and save me now. Amen. Find a Bible-believing church. When you get there, don't teach the pastor. Humble yourself. Let him help you. And we'll see you at the top, as one of your friends says, Zig Ziglar. God bless you. Amen.